Morning, everybody. It's, a, it's great fun to be here. I'm looking forward to having a lot of fun the next three days. Um, other than most, of, unlike most of you, I'm a computer scientist, and so the experiments we do are slightly different. I work in language technology, but we still do experiments. We still have data, although it's not about physical things, it's more about informational things, and we still communicate with one another through um, papers, essentially, PDF, at workshops and conferences and things. And like all of you, I'm frustrated with the limitations of this. So I'm looking forward to learning more about what we can do to modernize this sort of PDF. So one step of the communication is, of course, the paper you write, and then when you read it, the annotations you make on this, and the way that you use these annotations to enrich your own life, to connect with other papers and other people, and to uh, sort of complete the cycle so that the next round of experiments and theory formation can be springboarded off the current annotations in the current papers. So annotation, actually, let's see, is an important piece of the whole picture, I think. And so that's my, my particular interest here. And so um, I think when we have breakout groups, if there are people who are interested in annotation, it would be nice if we can share ideas and, and come up with some principles and some underlying structure of what annotation is all about and how it works in this context. So you can define annotation this way, the process of adding information to text or data, right? Not just text, when we say documents, we so mean the, the bigger context of, of the communication by humans or by machines, like language technology machines, the kind I build with my students in the labs. Usually this information is added in small places, little fragments, by small individual decisions, and the information you add is usually some kind of tag, or perhaps a bigger comment, or perhaps a link to something, or perhaps a relation across the pieces of text. All of these are possible, and they all have their own nature, and they all have to be standardized in some way that you can use them later on. So the question is like, what is that? How do you do that? What are the tools? What are the standards? And so forth. Typically, when you do annotation, you have to find the piece that you're that's of interest, and you have to make the mark on it and leave it in there, and the mark has to be recorded somehow. So there's different steps there. And then it's to, to sort of give guidance to these different steps, to give shape. It's useful to remember that the communication, the paper of the future, lives inside this cocoon, inside a cocoon of other papers, inside a cocoon of data, inside a cocoon of social network of researchers and, and people and experiments and life. And so the annotations have to be sort of anchored not only in the paper, but also in them. Now, how to manage all this is not so clear, right? Because you can go wild, and then you have a useless artifact, the same as you had in your paper before. You have these annotations on top of it. They're equally useless, just more text. So somebody should manage this stuff, so systematize it, maybe standardize it, organize it, make sure that new annotations conform with old ones, that you have this growing... Uh, um, sphere of communication that you can do something with automatically. And one important question is, what's the publisher's role in this? It's nice to hate publishers, but they are useful. And if they can actually be made to support the annotation process and actually standardize annotation, especially annotation and standardization of data, that would be fantastic. It's a lot of work to manage your data and to keep your data current and up to date as data standards and stuff evolve. If we pay them to do that rather than to sit on top of our PDF with copyrights and stuff, that would be fantastic in my view. So here are some questions in annotation that have come from all kinds of places. I've collected them from political science, from language technology and stuff. And some of them are more relevant to us today than others. The material that you annotate is probably less important a question. We know what we want to annotate. This is the stuff we read. The choices we make when annotating, instantiating some background model or theory or ontology to say what is it that we put in there and how do we sort of control a little bit the expression so we don't end up with just more freeform text and pictures and stuff, that we end up with something that machines can use and indexing systems can use. That's interesting. Of course, the tools we use, designing good interfaces, never using the mouse if possible, etc., using language technology to help, all these are things that are interesting to discuss. Which annotators to use? Do we train curators? Do we do it ourselves? Do we do the students? How do we make sure we get consistency, that we get certain amounts of coverage and, and, and internal consistency? If we do it tomorrow, we do the same thing. Important to do. The procedure, how you manage a large annotation process, whether you could use something like Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk or, or a Crowdflower in Europe to do this for you, if it's simple enough, or whether you have to have high quality trained um, um, people, curators, who cost a lot of money, that's an important, interesting question. How do you validate this? How do you make sure that people have done the right thing, have done it all, and have done it consistently? 
and what kinds of measures, kappa, flies, kappa, all kinds of things you can use to check this. And storage, how do you deliver this? How do you store this? What is the role of the publisher again? So the last slide here, some questions that particularly interest me, but there's of course lots of questions in this whole sphere. What, how can we share annotations? What's the role of ontologies and how can you manage them? And how much, when dif different people annotate something with different pieces from an ontology, does it mean that the ontology is broken or the ontology should be connected internally or something? What's all that? What does that mean? How does it work? How can we accelerate annotation using tools, using external people like Amazon's people out there on Mechanical Turk land, whatever? Should we and how can we validate annotations or check internal consistency? What kinds of tools can you use, etc.? And then what are the options for storaging and managing and publishing them? Again, again, the, the publisher's role. So this is the kinds of questions I think that are interesting to discuss inside annotation. And I look forward to sharing ideas with you and capturing some ideas and then maybe putting them into some kind of report at the end. Are there any questions or do we just go on? Just go on. Great, so, sorry about that, a little bit of a technical glitch just to start things off. So, um, um, the thing that I, so this is a section about data, and I think the most important thing um, that I'd like to emphasize that I think um, when we think of data, this is the way in which people m mostly think of, of data in the context of a publication. Um, how do we move forward? Okay. Is that um, data is often considered as uh, numbers and spreadsheets and uh, information that you might see in um, the uh, just simply contained in the supplemental data section of a paper. Now obviously this is uh, a gross um, simplification of, of how the, the, the data needs to be um, used in, in the context of publication and dissemination of information uh, going forward in the world of beyond the PDF. Um, and and in, in trying to kind of frame this brief discussion I wanted to try and uh, throw, a, throw my hands around the idea of data and what does it mean in the context of publication, how we think of these things. Um, and just to break things down, um, the one way of looking at it is that we have uh, tabulated, uh, so, so what is data uh, in this context? Firstly, tabulated data and graphs that you might find within uh, a paper. Um, I use the phrase observational assertions in text, so when you actually describe the uh, underlying evidence for the claims that you're making, that really, and, and you actually make a, a textual statement describing that, that's also forms under the category of data. And maybe even, I'd like to assert a, a little bit later on, perhaps the interpretations you make from that information is also, um, uh, could also be considered quote unquote data as well. Um, obviously the supplemental material that goes along with publications is um, a part of the infrastructure of publication that is grossly underrepresented and unstructured at the moment. And I'll have a, uh, my next slide dis um, describes a, an example of how bad things can get. Um, and then of course, and we mustn't overlook this, the interplay between data uploaded into databases and publications as well. There's a role to be played in the way in which these things work. And, and I was thinking in, 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 in the same way uh, that Ed just described of a definition that might be something that we want to work towards and think about in the context of um, beyond the PDF and data and how it all fits together. And I, I came up with the phrase, a practical architecture of observations and evidence. How do you know what you know? What is the, and, and I emphasize the practical side of this. Really what we need to be able to do is use whatever architecture we build in a very practical ongoing way in, so that a scientist can actually do stuff. So here's my horror story. Um, I was going through the um, uh, Phil's um, material for trying to work on the um, tuberculosis uh, uh, um, um, data that he published on, on, online, and he found a, a paper. And I'm, I'm sorry to cite it, but um, this isn't this isn't meant to, to be um, pejorative in any way. But this is an, an example of of the kind of thing that common practices lead to. And, and basically, what 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 this led to was the supplemental material of this paper that I cited is a 40-page PDF file of gene expression, and I actually did a, a screen capture from one page. The page itself is represented here, and the font was so small I couldn't read it, even with a magnifying glass. Um, the data itself was, was, it was basically, I mean, I could see what the author was doing. The author wanted to put his data in the publication. The only mechanism that he was provided to do that was by putting a PDF file in. So he dumped, everything, he dumped a very huge image into the publication, and that was that. There was no thought about 
trying to make this available and for reuse. Um, if it, you know, putting the same data in, into an Excel file would have been just as easy and far more practical, and yet they didn't do it. Why? Who did? What? What are the reasons for that? I don't know. But that's exactly the problem that we are facing with um, the context. How do we make data available and useful in the context of publication? And so, um, and I've, I've, just another quick example: the kind of things that we're talking about and the way in which they interoperate and inter interrelate within the current sphere of, of, of influence as demonstrated by the, the material that Phil put online is um, centered around here in this diagram, uh, the PowerPoint presentation um, and followed up by uh, a single publication links to the, t, uh, the tuberculosis drugome that was the, the formed the basis of the files that he presented and then of course other cited papers and the supplemental data all form a network of, of, of information that we need to, to work on. So um, how do we move the data beyond the PDF, right? So um, I'd say these are, these are, again, just simple principles that, that I thought of last night and, and just served simply to kind of seed the ground for future discussion, to try and encourage everybody to throw up their ideas uh, in, the, in the same way, that uh, just to kind of seed the debate. Um, so first of all, obviously, coming up with effective standards of terminology and information exchange. Um, is a key part of this discussion. The use of ontologies in this area is, is important, but it's by no means the, the only aspect. Once we get all, everybody ontologized and make sure that every single term has a single UID, we're not finished yet. That, that, there's probably more to do there. Um, very importantly, I think, and this, that's, if I can get anything from this meeting, I'd like to see development and get a clear idea of how this might work. Um, integration and coupling between data and the publication process, especially some form of linkage perhaps between peer review and bio-curation. Bio-curation is a big problem, and, and, and yet the process of actually publishing a paper involves someone going over the data and looking at it. Maybe the two things can be combined, just a thought. Um, and of course, in the data session that's occurring later on, we'll hear a little bit about um, new publica publication mecha mechanisms and sharing mechanisms such as wikis and other technology that can facilitate this, um, and uh, notions such as computable papers. Can we actually embed the data into a paper such that it's then freely available for, for subsequent use? And then, um, the uh, and of course, the, the whole idea of uh, data is something that you actually do something with. It's not just static numbers on a page. You want to you want to perform computations. So the technology surrounding workflows and other ways in which we can automate the process of bringing data together and making it functional is, of course, a key issue. So all of those ideas are things that we I think that are valid aspects of the discussion we'd like to move forward with, and um, we'd love to hear your ideas on all of these things. And so finally, um, I, I I just wanted to throw up this 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 slide um, to show you kind of how I think of the process of science and how one think how one actually performs and um, integrates science in a cyclic way and obviously um, the, the role of so we start off with I don't want to go into this too much but if you start off with an experimental design um, you gather data you make assertions based upon that data you then interpret those assertions and aggregate them into a, into a model that you can then reason over make predictions formulate a hypothesis, design experiments, and then perform the experiments. If this cycle, um, this is kind of high-level view of how the cycle of performing science could work, obviously data in, is um, an intrinsic part of it, but there's also the kind of interpretive framework as well that's important. So uh, thank you. I, I think, um, and, and so the next talk is about uh, data provenance and uh, poor growth. It's really quite appropriate that um, I'm after a uh, Gully talking about data because an important part of scientific publishing is documenting how we produce data, uh, where does our data come from, the conclusions that we put in papers, where does that come from, what was our procedures and practices. And to be honest, what we write in papers is often not very reproducible. It takes a lot of effort. A lot of stuff is hidden in notebooks like these. So one of the things about uh, the paper of the future is that I think we need more provenance and more exposed provenance. Because provenance provides this critical foundation of accessing authenticity, enabling trust, and allowing for reproducibility. So if we have some sort of provenance of data, we can um, do all these three things. And actually, there's been a lot of progress on developing provenance systems, um, 
And actually, you'll hear from those today in uh, this workshop. So we can kind of divide what you'll see uh, today up into three parts. So you'll see what I call workflow systems or systems to capture provenance. So you see um, uh, VizTrails and Wings and Dexy, all are systems designed to help you capture what you're doing in experiments and expose those. You'll see representations of provenance so that we can easily exchange what we've been doing. And that's over in the bottom uh, left-hand corner, right-hand corner. And then you'll see how do we connect these captures of the experiments that we're doing, the captures of data provenance, to papers to enable things like computable papers and reproducible papers. So we have these various technologies uh, that are out there today, and these are key parts of the provenance problem. And how do we come together to um, decide how we integrate that into the paper of the future? So I thought of a couple questions, but I'm hoping that we get a lot more around this subject of data provenance. So how do we connect provenance to our papers, right? That's the question I have. How far do we want to get on the road to full reproduci reproducibility, right? We may have techniques like virtual machines that let us completely reproduce what we've done, but they won't let anybody reuse what we've done, right? So there's this, um, this interplay between reproducibility and reusability. Um, how do we integrate uh, computational systems? How do we integrate experiments with our papers? And finally, um, there's some work on standardizing how we exchange provenance data. And maybe uh, we can discuss if it's time to push forward on being able to exchange the provenance of the data within our, within our papers. So there's lots of interesting questions and I'm looking uh, for some answers, but also some, for some more interesting questions around data provenance in this workshop. It's uh, really a thrill to be here and see so many people, some of whom I know for a long time and some of whom I'm finally meeting. I think uh, Phil is right. This is really a unique opportunity. I'd like to say a couple of words about new models. Um, I don't know how many of you recognize this picture. <clears throat> Raise your hand. It's very good. So that's, that's a, that was a real new model. That's Douglas Engelbart in 1968. Um, who was uh, showing his augment system, a system for uh, augmenting human intellect by connecting uh, people through computers. And I think nothing that we're doing today even comes close to what Engelbart did in 68. I still think it's a, it's a great uh, goal to strive for, the, the way in which um, the network was social and it was constructed from the bottom up. Um, quite exciting work that, that uh, I guess sets the tone for my, my couple of words about new models. Um, I think a lot of times it, it's very valuable to look at work that has been done and wonder why it hasn't been actually taken up. So um, I guess as you get older the word new starts to take on a kind of an ironic tone. Um, I remember joining Elsevier in 1988. I was a bushy-tailed, uh, low-temperature physicist. Um, and first we thought everything was, was fine. We were publishing journals and selling them to libraries, um, and that was all great. And the libraries were buying them and showing them uh, to, the, to the users. And then uh, in 91, Archive came, the preprint server. And in 93, my colleague Nico Popolier said, you've got to look at this. This is gopher with pictures. And we were thinking, go for with pictures, who cares? And then he said, no, 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 you don't understand. You can put pictures of your dog up. There's this guy who put up a picture of his dog. And suddenly we had this realization, and the first thought was, oh, shit, you know. Well, this means that anybody can publish anything. And essentially, as publishers, you know, our days are over. Um, and the second thought that we had was, well, we better come up with something new. Um, since everybody can clearly post their papers and all they need to figure out is the reviewing process. You know, there's no real reason for publishers even to exist. Um, and so we started getting very worried about and, and, and interested in what it was that we could do that was actually new. Um, oh, here's a picture of the archive server and this is, uh, for those of you who remember it, uh, the first, first Mosaic browser. Um, I want to jump forward 10 years. Um, together with Joost Kiertz at the uh, Royal Dutch Academy of Science, we organized uh, a conference that was called Changing Continuity in Science Communication. Um, and at that point, we said, all right, so everything is online now. 
but how is the article really changing? What is really changing here? You know, the fact that we can put paper online is not that thrilling. What are really uh, things that people are doing that are actually different? And we got 12 uh, editors of, of very revolutionary uh, journals to talk about what they were doing that was different. It was a very interesting conference. Um, and we thought, all right, so we, know, so we know where we're heading and it just needs to happen. Um, and so I guess here we are um, in 2011, um, we're at the Beyond the PDF. I think uh, from the discussions, it's fair to say that it's not just Beyond the PDF. We're also interested in moving beyond other tools such as Word, um, the way the databases are done, and maybe other tools like Google. Um, I think the idea is how do we really make the next step in changing the way that we publish science, right? Um, so I wanted to... Oh, this, oh, didn't get chopped up. I wanted to talk about a couple of items that sort of way back then we thought um, it would be very important and very interesting to really change. So I think the, the top one is really the article format. So the article in itself is a linear narrative. Um, and, and I think around you know, the, the time of Mosaic and all of that, we thought, well, we have to have a smaller publishable unit. This whole article, this whole story, why do we keep writing these stories? And why do people keep needing to read these stories? Can't we have a smaller publishable unit, just a thought that you put out there and that you increment? And surely you don't need to re repeat your introduction for every single paper that you write. Um, another idea was the business models. We were quite convinced that everything would be free, since, since on archive it was already solved. So technically there was no impediment. It was just a matter of, of actually uh, figuring out the review process and everything would be fine. Um, the research data was another point. So um, how are we going to store and make accessible to everybody the research data? And, and it was clear that some fields uh, pretty much had this figured out. Um, astronomy in particular was uh, doing a great job of figuring out what, what is the research data? How do we access it? Let's all agree on standards and let's all deposit our data in the same place. So it was almost solved in astronomy, so we figured it would be almost solved everywhere. Um, databases, there was a lot of work that was still being done by curators. Um, it was clear that they needed some help, so we needed some tools to help the curators. Authoring tools, we needed something besides Word and WordPerfect. And there were those who had LaTeX, and they were perfectly happy, so they didn't need anything else. But those of us using Word and WordPerfect really needed something. Um, annotation tools, it seemed obvious that, and, and again, harking back to the era of Engelbart and, and before, and the hypertext community, it was clear that now that we had hyperlinks, even though they were kind of boring compared to the hyperlinks that people had envisioned, which were sort of both ways and one-to-many linking and all that, hyperlink was a start at least. Um, but we needed more interesting annotation tools and ways to interact and to let the information that was out there interact with our personal information store and share all that. Um, reviewing tools, it was clear that the days of closed peer review were over, right? Because, I mean, there was no need for it anymore, really. So we, we could just put an article up there and everybody can comment on it. Um, search, there was a great thought that there would be personal scientific search environments. So I live in my own universe of data, my own universe of information. Um, and surely it would be possible to create a tool that would take that into account with everything I searched. It knows what, what meaning I have behind a certain concept. Um, and I could create my searches and it would remember what I had looked for before. It remembered what data I was storing personally and I was able to share that. Uh, to, uh, share that. Interactive math, again, seemed to be uh, quite solved because LaTeX had, had solved it and there were standards appearing. And chemistry, Peter Murray Rust was already working on most of the, the key standards and that was clearly almost solved. So, all right, so we, we fast forward, whoops, went up. Uh, oh, okay, I guess I can't do, I can't do, uh, what you're trying to, what I want to do is show you the middle column and then the end column. So please blank out the end column, please. All right, so article formats uh, 10 years later uh, was 2001, the semantic web hit. Um, yes, we were now calling these semantic papers and we still had the idea that surely a paper could be smaller than this long linear narrative. And, and the semantic web would offer fantastic tools for us to go and build this. Um, business models, well, there was the author paid model. It was the days of PubMed Central and Vitek Trutch and David Lippmann were really revolutionizing. So this was clearly the start and the rest would follow very quickly. Research data now was solved in astronomy. They had the astronomical data center and all the rest of us needed to do was just follow their lead. Um, databases, well, the curators still needed help, but there was clearly some work going on in recognizing proteins that would be done. Authoring tools, we still needed something besides Word. Annotation tools were probably going to come soon. We had Annotia, it was going to happen. We were going to have 
things like that. Reviewing tools that were experiments in 2001 on open peer review, the BMJ did that, a journal called uh, Journal of Interactive Media and Education that Simon Buckingham Schum did very uh, advanced experiments. So again, this would probably happen. Search um, Stefan Decker's idea of the semantic desktop where you have your own environment that where you contain your own content and then you share it uh, with, with uh, people that you know um, and you share it with, with like-minded folks. Um, interactive math, MathML was there, just needed to be implemented, and chemistry now was solved by Peter Murray Rust, it just needed to be implemented. So, well, 2011, I guess what's interesting, there is indeed a lot of effort uh, in, the, in the smaller publishable units. So I think in terms of modular and semantic uh, formats, uh, things like the, the ontology of rhetorical blocks developed by the W3C, nano publications, you know, smaller access, and linked open data is really helping in this sense. So I think there we've actually have made a real step. Um, business models, not much has happened as far as I can see since 2001. Um, research data is still solved in astronomy, but it's not in other fields. Databases, curators still need help. Uh, authoring tools, we still need more uh, than Word. Um, annotation tools, we, I think, have deferred collectively to PDF as being the standard, and we're not worrying about it. Reviewing tools, similarly, we use a wiki, but we haven't really worked on that. Search, I think we've collectively just let go, more or less. Um, interactive math still needs to be implemented. Interactive chemistry still needs to be implemented. So. I think um, what's important, uh, maybe uh, new models, you know, captures the whole workshop, so it's, so it's kind of easy for me to talk. Um, I think there are indeed very interesting ideas out there. Um, I do think that we, as, as a community, have perhaps given up on certain things that we should not give up on. Um, I think it's very important that we reclaim the entire space, for instance, of search of how I interact with my desktop. You know, I mean, there are big companies and they do have software out there, but it's not tailored for scientists. It's often, you, you can't find, as Peter Murray Russ was making this point yesterday, you cannot find any data on Google. You cannot, you cannot put any non-textual information in there. It's all driven by needs that are not the scientists' needs. So um, I think what is incredibly important as we go through these days is to say, first of all, the, the key point is how will all these uh, improvements that we're proposing. How will they actually improve science? How are we impacting science? Uh, Marianne Marton, who I believe is speaking, said, you know, with everything that I do, I need to go back to the neuroscientist and say, all right, what major discovery came out of this? You know, 95% um, of the universe is full of uh, black matter. We don't know what it is. You know, how are we going to help find that black matter? How are we going to solve the key issues in science by improving the format of the paper? Um, I don't think we should give away things just yet. I think in some areas we've become a little complacent, um, and I think we should claim back spaces like search. Um, things like, you know, your desktop. I still have three filing systems, one on my desktop, one in my email, and one in my uh, bookmark folder. Why can't I just have one single filing system already, you know, and that knows what I mean by a certain word, because I always mean that, and things like that. So I, I think a lot of times we need to be a little... Uh, not be complacent and not say, well, the commercial companies are dealing with this because they don't have the interest of science at hand. Then I think it's important to say when we do find such big questions, you know, why were these not implemented? What are the really sociological, political, financial, economical, you know, human drivers that have not made them pick up? Why aren't we all following astronomy's lead? Um, and what are the major, major hurdles that are preventing us from implementing them? And who can take away these impediments? Let's talk to these people and let's find out why they're not changing and what will motivate them to change. Um, and then when are they going to do this? I mean, to me, really, this, this workshop offers an opportunity. So first of all, after we get some overview of all the things that are being done, but now to sit down and write, when are we going to make this actually happen? Um, take all these good ideas and, and really make them happen. All right, thank you. Um, so what I'm just going to do is just to remind you that each of us is sort of moderating a session that, uh, of, that will be, take place as part of the breakout sessions and you'll choose which breakout sessions to go to uh, to discuss these things and this, this is just a sort of preamble of what, uh, what the kinds of discussions would be. So when I actually looked at the questions, I'm, I'm going to moderate the writing section. Um, this, this is essentially what the sort of some of the major questions that came out of um, reading the, the papers that are going to be discussed in the, those 10-minute segments. 
And in some ways, they've been uh, uh, discussed already in different contexts, in different areas, and that's, of course, there is overlap. But I just want to make a, point, a different point. And the point I want to make is one as a domain scientist who is really the customer for what comes out of this. And that the way that some of us are beginning to view publication. Um, I mean, and of course, the, the real issue is this balance with publication on one end and reward on the other. And until we actually change in some way how we think about the reward system, it's likely that getting publication to change dramatically is just not going to happen. And I think that, so we really need to begin working on that. And just to illustrate that point, um, you know, in some ways, you know, I just take my own laboratory as an example. I mean, last year I think we published or we submitted and 22 papers were published and another 13 uh, are in some form of revision. So is that collective work really getting a message out in the maximized form? In some sense, I would suggest the answer is probably no. On the other hand, um, you know, those, the people who are doing the work need some recognized reward. So again, so it's just an example of how these things are tied together. And then I think the, the, the notion of how, of what a paper is worth is, is also something that we need to start uh, emphasizing in different ways. I mean, I think in terms of, as for those who are domain scientists in, in the room, uh, how we view our scholarship. So for example, I write things that actually are hardly ever cited, but they're downloaded many, many thousands of times. And that to me is uh, a part of scholarship and it's actually uh, you know, something I'm actually proud to be doing. On the other hand, you know, I'm just raising different examples here of, of trying to sort of point out how we need to think about changing the system. On the other hand, you know, I have you know, one paper that's about a database that's been cited 10,000 times. Well, no one has ever read that paper and no one really cares about that paper. They care about the database. But it's that particular reference that gives the reward uh, to us and also to, it makes the people who are using it you know, re uh, feel good about it or it's important for the scholarship. So, you know, on the other hand, I've published papers that have not been cited very many times at all that I'm very proud of because I think they represent some, uh, some change. So I think there are all of these things that, as you go through this exercise, uh, think about, for those of you who are, are working really on, on other sides of this, say particularly the technical side, to think about what this means to people like me at the end because the only way I'm ever going to adopt any of these things is if uh, when I'm writing that the, what I rewrite and what I actually provide, whether it be data or knowledge or whatever, it, it's, there still has to be, we have to move towards recognizing a reward for that. So that's, that's all and hopefully we'll discuss this some more. Cameron? Okay, so in some senses, I think I've got the poison chalice. I also note that um, one of the categories that um, Phil didn't include in his group of people here was troublemakers. Um, it's definitely, definitely where a lot of us fit, I suspect. Um, I you were all troublemakers. We're all trouble. Okay, that's yeah. fair enough. Okay, so we start with the question of what, what peer review does and, and why, we're, why we're fond of it, why, why we're using it. Um, and I think the, I kind of try to figure out what were the, what were the main things that peer review peer review does, and I think this is a reasonable kind of list of the kind of reasons people regard it as important. First, the decision whether you're going to commit resources to the process of publication and dissemination, technical assessment of, of validity of the methods and conclusions in a paper, an assessment of the importance or the impact of that work, depending on which journal it ends up with, and the, also to support discovery, to make the discovery process easier by helping people look in the right places for the research they're interested in. So as, as scientists, obviously we're going to critique this and make sure that it's still the truth today and then to look at the data that supports these assertions. Um, and as we start to do that, we start to run into some problems. So on the web, publication, I think so, one thing I'd suggest is we start to try and define some language so we can actually speak to each other. So the process of publication on the web is as near to zero cost as, as to make no difference. The cost of formal publication, of putting that in a place which is indexed and archived and looked after and curated, that does cost money. But the, the question of 
making a decision whether to expend resources to make something public and distribute it uh, is not really one that we need to particularly worry about. And we know that the assessment of whether something ends up in nature or nature structure or biology or cell or molecular cell, really that's not a particularly objective process. We know this. There's a lot of evidence that, that supports this. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of evidence that supports the fact that it's actually completely useless for technical assessment of um, the validity of, of um, papers in particular. The classic example of this is Richard Smith, when he was editor of the BMJ, deliberately inserting errors into papers that were sent out for, for, for review. 95% of those errors, which included serious ones that actually reversed the conclusion of the paper, were never caught. Um, and the other problem is that actually you know, none of this matters because we're all searching through Google Scholar anyway. So actually where things are, you know, so, so why, why are we bothering with any of this, frankly? Um, um, and the answer is that, and I should have included obviously the XKCD cartoon here, um, science works because of peer review, because of the review process that goes through looking at science, looking at papers. So how do we match these two things? We have no evidence that it actually works, and yet we know that in the end of the day we can actually do useful stuff with science. So some of this process must be working somewhere along the line. And I think the, point, the key point to realise is that we're talking about two different processes, and we, again, we need to talk about the language here. So I'm going to suggest that we talk about PPPR and PPPR. <laughs> um, Pre-publication peer review, post-publication peer review, we need to divide those things out. So we have a situation at the moment where we have a formal pre-publication process, it's not transparent in any real sense. You don't know who the reviewers were, you don't know what the disagreements were, you don't know how the paper was changed in most cases. It's a binary process, paper is either published or not published. I'd suggest that it's basically useless as a process and it's really very expensive. There are various estimates running around about what we spend globally on peer review and they run from about 1.5 billion up to about 5 billion US dollars a year. That is money we could be spending on curing malaria or solving other important problems. So this is a problem. We, we do have a post-publication peer review, and this is actually how we really run the scientific process. We look at whether results hold up under testing. We look at whether um, people continue to agree with the results of a paper. But this process is informal. It's largely unrecorded. It's quite slow. Sending a letter to the editor saying that you disagree, writing another paper, pointing out what the, the, the flaws in something were is a problem and it takes a long time. It does seem to, in the long term, actually lead to a scientific process that seems to work. We generate results that do seem to map on reality. Um, but there's a lot of unrealised value and there's a lot of information in this process that we're not successfully extracting from the system. So what I suggest is we want to move to systems where we, I'm not necessarily saying, oh, well, I would actually quite like to get rid of pre-publication peer review, but I'm not sure that's really a flyer right at the moment. Um, so I think we're still going to end up with a formal process of, of peer review that ideally would be more transparent, that maybe some of this is automated processing. Do the results and the methods actually work? Does the software or the underlying systems work? And how much of this can we automate to bring the costs down? How can we really extract and do valuable pre-publication peer review that, that delivers some value and, and bring that cost down. And in terms of post-publication peer review, can we move to a mixture of both formal and, in infor and informal processes, some of which are recorded in a structured form that is faster and more effective, that is still valid and useful, and that we're realising the value out of this for search purposes, for annotation, for structuring, for reward processes, and that we get information that's usable. So again, Drawing on the Paul's pressure, just point out some of the things that are going on in this space and some of the things you're going to hear about. So Paul will talk about total impact, um, and he's got a paper on from claim to fact based on the, the data that um, Phil made available, and logical publishing and supporting active reading, and so he's deciding what not to read, which is obviously an important part of you know, deciding how you're going to spend your day. And I just also wanted to point out some other obvious projects. So Pete Binfield is here, and I imagine we'll talk about article level metrics in some form at, at, at some point. Um, so looking beyond the journal to the, to, the, to the value of the article itself. And I also just wanted to mention, again, because Paul is here, altmetrics.org is an effort to try and expand the way that um, research is measured. And I'm running a workshop in London in May um, to look at, at research impact and 
how we can actually provide some, some quantitative and, again, structured information out of that to support exactly the kind of things that Phil was just talking about. So the questions I think we need to, to deal with, you know, what, does, what works? How can we actually apply a scientific process to the process of doing science? Because we don't. And maybe we should if we were to believe in our own philosophy. Um, what evidence do we have? Because people really are fairly unaware of the evidence about what does and doesn't work. Um, what kind of tools and systems and frameworks might support effective pre-publication and post-publication peer review? What do we need to build? What do we need to support? What kind of people do we need and what kind of training should we give people? And as Phil has pointed out and Anita has pointed out, all of these things are the same things that many of us have been banging on for the last 5, 10, 20, if Merton was in the audience, 40 years. How do we actually make this happen? How do we actually make people, motivate people, researchers, the public, the funders, the publishers, everyone involved to actually change the process? So this is the cultural issue, which I'm sure is going to come up again and again and again. And if we could solve it, then we might make some progress. So thanks, Cameron, for that. Um, so I think the idea here is you've got some form of flavour of what's going to transpire in these discussion groups. This is discussion, so we'll, you know, we'll really get to that, and I think that's going to be the most important part of the meeting. I just want to take uh, a couple of minutes just to thank um, the people who've made this, this thing possible before we get into the individual presentations. And Tim, maybe you want to come up and set up while I'm, I'm saying this. Um, so uh, in terms of support for this, uh, the Doris Duke uh, Charitable Foundation uh, have been a significant part of this. Uh, Microsoft, and thanks to Lee Dirks for that. Uh, NCI, uh, and thanks, for, uh, thanks to Dan for that. Um, Creative Commons, uh, thanks to John Wilbanks uh, and Elsevier. Uh, if you're having a drink tonight, you can think of Elsevier. Um, uh, and thanks to Anita and Alan for that. And, uh, the people in my shop, my assistant Anne, who God knows how she puts up with me, but uh, it's just so helpful with all of this. Nadine's our budget officer and has really helped. And Samantha, Sammy's the person that's out the front who's uh, dealing with the Cal IT stuff. And uh, uh, so don't hesitate to contact that office if you're, or those people out there if you're having issues. Uh, so uh, we'll now get into some individual presentations in the annotation section, and Ed will take care of that and keep, make sure people stay on time. <laughs>